All right, so in this problem we have a block of mass m. It's initially pressed against a spring, and that spring is compressed by an amount delta. Kind of hard to draw that in here. Uh, but the spring is compressed by an amount delta. You, you let the mass go, and the spring propels it up the, up the ramp here. Pretty steep, it looks like. The ramp is at an angle theta relative to vertical. And there's friction between the block and the, and the ramp. Give, are characterized by these coefficients of friction, u k mu s. Uh, did I say the spring constant was k? So all that stuff is given there. My initial speed is zero. And what I want to do is I want to find out how far this box slides up the ramp before turning around and heading back down. So I'm going to start with this problem with the free body diagram. Here it is. So I've got my weight uh, pulling downward. I've got a normal force perpendicular or normal to the, to the ramp. I've got a, a spring force, I'm just calling Fs, like so, and I just realized I forgot my friction force, gotta put that in there. That's, that's of course why we draw these free body diagrams, so we catalog all these forces. To solve this problem, that is to find the distance L, I'm going to be using the work energy principle. Why work energy principle? Well, the easy way for me to answer this is that I've done a thousand of these problems and I know, I know the best way to do it. Uh, but as a novice, it's not easy to know which way is the best way to do it. So I'm going to describe why work energy principle at the end after we've done it, and we'll see exactly what advantages it gives us in this problem. So uh, in approaching this with the work energy principle, the first question I want to ask is, uh, which forces do the work? So we'll start off, we'll go about one by one uh, through these forces, starting with the weight. The weight does negative work because gravity is pulling downward, right? The weight force is pulling downward, but the block is moving upward. So that F dot dr, that dot product, is going to be negative. Next, we'll do normal force. The normal force, as usual, not always, but as usual, it does zero work because this, the, the normal force is perpendicular to the path. Next on the list is the spring force, called Fs. This one does positive work because the spring force is, well, the spring is compressed. So it's pushing against the block. It's pushing upward and to the right. The block itself is moving upward and to the right. So this is a positive amount of work. And then finally, we have the friction force. And notice that the friction force is downward and to the left, right? The block is moving upward and to the right. So the friction force is opposing that motion opposite directions. So the, the friction force and the direction of motion are in opposite directions. So therefore, that work must be negative. So then now that friction force, in order to calculate the work, I'm going to actually have to know how big it is. And you may recall for force due to friction, its magnitude is equal to, since we're sliding, it's going to be mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction, uh, times the magnitude of the normal force. So we're going to need to find this normal force in order to get the friction, in order to calculate the work done by friction. Even though normal force doesn't do any work, we need to get it through, we need to get it in order to get the friction. So to find that normal force, I'm going to, going to use Newton's second law, F equals MA, but that's the only place I'll use Newton's second law, right? Just to find that force, I won't use it to find anything else in the problem. So let me clear some space for Newton's second law. I already have a free body diagram. I've written a, written a mass acceleration diagram. Uh, since the block is moving along a straight path, the acceleration must be tangent to that path. Notice I've also decomposed my weight into an E hat 1 and an E hat 2 components. I've decomposed my normal force into it. that. All of that one's in the E hat 2 direction. So Newton tells us that in the E hat 2 direction, direction perpendicular to the ramp, some of the forces, well, I've got a normal force, obviously, um, in the E hat 2. I've got one component of the weight. I've split the weight into an E hat 1 and an E hat 2 components. Uh, so one component of the weight is in the E hat 2 direction, and that's the sine component, so minus mg sine theta. What does that have to equal? That has to equal mass times the component of acceleration in the E hat 2 direction. And all my acceleration's in the E hat 1, so I've got no acceleration in the E hat 2, so therefore the normal has to equal mg sine theta, which tells us that the friction force must be mu k m g sine theta in the minus minus e hat one direction. So now I'm going to switch the work energy principle, which simply states that the work in going from some point A to some point other point B is a change in kinetic energy. Now I have to label what A and B are. So A is going to be the the, the state in which this 
the block was just released, right? It's just about ready to shoot up the up the ramp. So I'll call that A, and I'll call state B the the instant where the block uh, reaches its maximum height before turning around. Call that B. So the work can go in from A to B. Let's go. Let's start with that. Remember, it comes from a few different sources. One is due to gravity. The work done by gravity has a particularly sim simple form. We do not have to do any integration whatsoever because I've already done it once for you. And once you've seen it once, you've seen it forever. So the work done by gravity is m times g times the change in height. So we started off with a, a height down here, ended up with a height up there. And that change in height is L times, it looks like this angle right here would be theta. So how about L times cosine of theta, right? But then you have to account for the fact that the block is being upward while, while weight is going downward. We said weight does a negative work, so minus MGL cosine theta. Next, we move over to the work done by the spring force. Spring force is pushing that block up the hill. It's going to be a positive work. And again, this is another one of those forces that we've integrated once. We don't have to do this ever again. It starts off with an initial compression of delta. So I got a work that's 1 half k times delta squared. And normally I'd have a piece in there that was my final compression. But we're assuming that this block or the spring becomes completely decompressed as it flies out. So I only have the work 1 half k times delta squared, which is always the work done by a spring. And then what else? I have work done by the friction force. Friction force, we just worked out over here, at least its magnitude is mu k mg sine theta. All of those terms are constant, right? Theta's not changing, mass isn't changing, friction coefficient, gravity, none of those are changing. So perfect constant. So what we have is the work done by a constant force. Whenever we have that, it's a really simple case because the force, or excuse me, the work is just that force or the magnitude of the force times the distance traveled. And again, this is doing min or negative work, so I'm going to say minus uk mg sine theta times L, the distance traveled. And I think that's all for our work. The only other force remaining is this normal force. Normal force does not do work because it's perp perpendicular to the path. So this total work has to equal change in kinetic energy. What's, what's my kinetic energy at state B? This is where we come up and reach its highest height and before turning around, right? So at that instant we're at B, this thing has no velocity, it has no speed, and hence has no kinetic energy. So TB equals zero. How about kinetic energy at point A? Remember point A is right when we released the block. Right when we release the block, it hasn't gained any momentum yet. It doesn't have any velocity yet. It's still stationary. So the kinetic energy at A is also going to vanish. So therefore, this total work must be zero. Now, one question I often get from students is, why in this work done by gravity and also in the work done by friction, why is there the entire L there? Why not have L minus delta instead, right? Because the first delta that the things move that this thing moves, it is being pushed by the spring, right? So it's not until after the block leaves the spring that the gravity acts and then the friction acts. At least that's one frame of thought. But that's not how this problem set up. The friction is present on the entire ramp all the way down even when the spring is compressed. So while the spring is pushing that block upward, in contact with the block, actively pushing it, friction is engaged as well and friction is actively opposing it. Same with gravity. Gravity's, gravity doesn't kick in all of a sudden when the, when the spring and, and the block separate. The gravity's working on this block even when the spring's pushing it up, actively pushing it up. Let's take stock of which variables in this equation are known and which ones are unknown. Mass is known. G is known. L is my unknown. I've got a cosine theta where theta is known. I've got 1 half k delta squared. All that's known. Mu k is known. Sine theta, just like cosine theta, it's known. Weight. The only thing I do not know in this is the length L. And that's cool. I got one equation with one unknown. L is appearing linearly. So I should be able to just solve for L. So now solving for L is pretty much a piece of cake. We get something like this. And let's put a box around it because there's my answer. Before I accept this as, as final, I should do a unit check real quick. So what do we get? I've got a K up here. What's K? K is a force due to spring is equal to K times the amount the spring is compressed. So K has units of force divided by length. Force is mass length over time squared. I'm dividing by a length, 
but I guess I put it right there. And that's the numerator. Oops, I forgot delta squared, so I got a, a length squared still. And now in the denominator, I have 2mg. So this is a mass length over time squared. And then inside the square brackets, I have a cosine theta, which is unitless, and mu k, which is unitless, sine theta, which is unitless. unitless. Why is mu k unitless? Well, over here, we pretty much spelled it out. Our friction force is just mu k times the normal force. Uh, friction force is a force. Normal force is a force, so mu k has to be unitless. So notice that the masses cancel out. So let me get rid of the masses. The 1 over time squared from bottom and top both cancel each other out. So all I have left here is I still have a length squared in the numerator, right? I've got this length squared. I've got that length divided by that length. So those two cancel each other out. Boom, boom. So length squared in the numerator. In the denominator, I just have a length. So this is equal to a length. So unit checked, which is cool. I wanted a length out of this. So there's my answer, and I guess I'm sticking with it. Now before I end this video, make, let me make a few statements about the work energy principle. First of all, the work energy principle is incredibly simple for this problem. We did have to do a bunch of sort of upfront bookkeeping work uh, just to sort things out. But once we dive, dove into our analysis, look, the work energy principle is just one line long for us. Real super insulin. Here's the work. There's the change in kinetic energy. Solve for the length. Boom. Done. Real simple. And this work energy approach often, almost always, but often I'll say, uh, reduces the effort involved in, in calculating these things. So it's work energy is wonderful. But you can't always use it. Let's suppose, for example, instead of being asked to find the distance L, the, t the distance from the bottom to the top, what if we were asked to find the time instead? The time from when the block was released until it reaches the very top. Then what? So if we go look at the work energy principle, what do we have? It says work and going from A to B equals change in kinetic energy. The work, of course, is an integral over, over a path. So you start at some point A, you go to some point B. In space, you integrate over a path. There's no time in there whatsoever. And on the right-hand side, the kinetic energy, that's a change in kinetic energy, one-half mass times speed squared. Again, no time here either. So you cannot use a work energy principle if you're going to try to find the time it takes to get from point A to point B or halfway to point B or anything like that. It's all about distances and forces and speeds. So if you look at the quantities we have available to us in our problem, the one we actually solved, what is it? They're, they're things that tell us about the forces, right? Mass, which will give us a weight. We have a spring coefficient, which will give us a spring force. We've got friction coefficients, which give us friction forces. We've got geometric things. We've got lengths, lengths. We've got initial speed. These are all the boundary conditions for the work energy problem. We don't have a time in here. The time would not fit. So this is a natural work energy type problem. At least this is a problem that has work energy type boundary conditions that you would solve for or use. So another feature of this problem that makes a work energy approach particularly attractive is the type of forces involved. Look what we have. We have weight in this problem. Calculating the work done by weight is very easy, right? M times G times a change in height. Couldn't be easier than that. We have a spring force as well. Also another easy force for which to, one can calculate weight. The only one that could be tricky is this friction force. But in our case, we're moving along a ramp that's perfectly straight. So the normal force is going to be a perfect constant, not going to change in time or in, in space. Therefore, the friction force, kinetic friction, is going to be a constant. And it's real easy to find the work done by a constant force. So in, in summary, this is a perfect problem for work energy principle. It would take a lot more effort to do it with F equals MA directly.